recognizing and then addressing Conway's law in your own organization. Now, I want this presentation to be additive. I want it to build on stuff that's already out there. That does mean it comes with a little bit of homework if you're really passionate about this stuff. At the 2016 API Strat Conference, I presented three ways Conway's law affects API governance. In that talk, I presented three different scenarios where the organizational parameters affected the API design. And if you're really interested in this stuff, I highly encourage you to go seek that out and read how things like hierarchy, geographical organization, and third-party lines of communication end up changing the API design in very specific ways. But I also want to provide at least one new example for folks, and that comes by way of Buffer. Buffer is a social network management platform, and in late 2015, Buffer acquired a company called Respondly. It's a software that enabled social media teams to respond to customers. Technical leadership of Buffer now suddenly found, them, found themselves in charge of two different monoliths. And these monoliths really didn't talk with each other, either code-wise or personnel-wise. They kind of kept to themselves and ran as they had before. And despite offering complementary products, whenever it came time to do some kind of feature that would bridge across the two, things really didn't work. This was the organization and the way the organization was structured that was negatively impacting the ability to deliver business value. So in March 2017, Buffer reimagined itself as a platform that would support multiple complementary products. The technical team realigned themselves into a set of teams responsible for core functionalities. So that's, that's key. The organization realigned itself, not to think of itself as Buffer and Respondly, but rallied around the idea of delivering core capabilities, things like billings, sessions, centralized storage for social media account connections. And then on top of that, they reorganized their architecture now that they had the organizational part in place around the things that customers needed to get things done, things like publish and reply and analyze. To deliver the most value to the customer, Buffer needed to change its architecture, which necessitated a change to its organization. So that's the impact. That's the power that organizations have on software delivery. But can we go the other way? Is this bi-directional? Can the architecture drive organizational change, or does it always have to start with the organization? Vicki Boykis is a data scientist and techno technology essayist. In her juice, June 6th newsletter, she wrote, something happened in the last 30 years where developers transformed from some nerds sitting in the company's basement, or in my particular case, I'm still in my, my basement, uh, to the driving force of the company itself. Developers now have a lot of power and consequently are doing just as much work in building companies as they are in building code. Some of you might be familiar with the Chinese practice of feng shui. It's a design practice that attempts to use the arrangement of objects to harmonize people in their surroundings. Likewise, APIs are arrangement of power. Designed with purpose, the arrangements have the power to shape organizations. This is not a new concept. I mentioned feng shui. And there's also another practice called socio-technical systems engineering. That dates back to World War II. The word socio-technical that I mentioned earlier refers to the interrelatedness of social and technical aspects of an organization. It seeks to optimize both the people and the machine in order to improve performance and work-life quality. Taking a socio-technical systems approach, an API practice attempts to identify the systematic power arrangements that exist within an organization. As I explained earlier, these factors can have an enormous impact on the software produced. And yet, if it's so powerful, why do we rarely see this? If I were to speculate, and really, you know, that's kind of the fun part of this, right? If I were to speculate, I would guess that this messy, complicated work with people is something outside of most engineers' training, or it's something that might be derisively regulated to the humanities, 
Or perhaps it's because most people are used to thinking about only their individual pieces and rarely of systems as a whole. Whatever the reason, given the power that organizational arrangements have on the ability to deliver quality code, that's a shame and a huge untapped area for us to have some, some work to be done. Danella Meadows was one of the foremost system thinkers. In her books, thinking in her book, Thinking in Systems, she said, you can't out-tool or out-code a people problem. And ultimately, this is why the cargo culting fails. All the importing of another company's open source toolkits and their deployment playbooks and their social media outreach does nothing to address the organization they're arriving in. So what do we do about this? Using the architecture as a beachhead for changing an organization has a name. Some of you might have heard of it. It's the inverse Conway maneuver. And it's where the architectural needs required for consistent cohesive design and fast flow are considered first. And then the organization is designed from that. And I know, I know, I'm just a developer. I'm just an architect. You're asking me to change the organization? Change happens all the time in ways both big and small. Lots of us probably know the apocryphal story about the Bezos memo. And you know that was when one day in 2003, Jeff Bezos from on high sent a letter to everybody and it said, all right, everybody build APIs and anybody that doesn't do this will be fired. That sounds harsh. He did end it with, and I hope everybody had a great day. So, you know, you know, kind of a passive aggressive thing going on there. But what that was, was Bezos with high hierarchical power coming down and saying, we need to change the architecture to take us to the next place, to take our business to where it needs to go. And as a result, AWS now makes tens and tens and tens of billions of dollars every single year. The architecture changed and it took the business, the organization to a different place. You're probably not Jeff Bezos. If you are, I might have a pitch for you after this. But if you're somebody that doesn't have that quite a amount of power, it's not a matter of you not being able to affect change. It just means we need to recalibrate the size of the change that you're able to make. There's lots of different ways to do it. There's only so many things that I can get into in a 20 minute conversation. And I will say it is work. That might be homework best left for the, the audience. And it is dependent on your context. So keep that all in mind. But let's cover two specific things in the time that we have left. One, you shrink the change. And two, you script the critical moves. So when you shrink the change, it's, it's acknowledging the appropriate levers that you have to pull and then beginning to work at the appropriate level. Starting with the entire organization might be a bit much and you'll probably be met with the proportional amount of resistance. However, if you can't start with the organization, can you start with your line of business? If you can't start with your line of business, can you start with your program that you're in? If you can't start with the program, can you start with your team? And if you can't change your team right now, maybe change how you communicate and with whom. So much of this is about the complexity of our communication and who we are doing that communication with. Think about APIs. The way that the APIs are structured and the way that the information can flow is a very important mechanism. It's power, it's awareness. So if you start changing your communication patterns, if you seek out those people that you might not otherwise have found, if you start building alliances in places that didn't exist before, you are changing access to information, you're beginning to work in a different way and possibly leading to different results. A sense of progress is critical because people can get easily demoralized. People need reassurance and the easiest way to reassure them is making progress, quick progress. And the easiest way of making quick progress is shrinking the change, celebrating the victories along the way. That's one idea. Another idea is to script the critical moves as the dog goes nuts upstairs. He's a big fan of scripting the critical moves. 
in this time of ambiguity, people don't have a tremendous amount of headspace for the unknown. We are dealing with stresses we've never dealt with before, and the energy levels for taking on something new aren't there. What you can do if you are intent on making change happen is helping people by providing the incremental steps for them, allowing them to incrementally move toward a better state. One of the things that I'm working on currently with James Higginbotham, which some of you might know as Launch Any, is a prescriptive process for designing bounded contexts. Now, that is a whole ocean of stuff, excellent ways of doing it. However, right now for our organization, we need to script the critical moves, giving them the incremental steps, the roadmap that easily take them from A to B. Yes, maybe there's alternatives. Yes, maybe some of those are better, but unfortunately we don't have the bandwidth for that now. And if change is gonna happen, we need to make it as easy as possible. We're scripting the moves for them. There's also, I mentioned in the team topology book, there's also some fantastic guidelines. If you don't know how to organize teams, how to drive change with the team structure, the book Team Topologies is absolutely fantastic for that. Also, these two techniques that I talked about are in a book called Switch, which I, which I featured on the screen this last couple of times. I would also highly recommend that particular item. But let's get real for a moment. And if we're going to get real, I need to walk over here and have a talk with my superheroes. You know who you are. You're working on things. You're trying to make things better every single day. Okay? I respect you. I hear you. I also want to address the fact that we will spend thousands of dollars for training. We will fly people across the continent. We will bring in external consultants, maybe even an oracle. And yet, when it comes to our communication and making that effective, the thing that we do every single day, we can't be even bothered to Google that. That's wrong. We deal with people. We spend all of our research and budget on figuring out how to work with the machines, but it's the people that matter. It's the people that last. And so if you go down this path, I would highly encourage you, stop, take a moment, supplement your technology training with people resources. I'll list some at the end of this. And that's ultimately how you're gonna affect change. Change is not Kubernetes. Change is not service mesh changes people and then you might get along and do some of those other things is that okay let's finish up here okay let's take it home so in conclusion when it comes to software systems many people might just assume that apis are a technology thing and that api governance is just a checklist just a set of rules that need to be checked off in order to get into production while the enforcement of common practice on something like an open API description of intent might seem like a, a tactic, it's not a strategy. Governance broadly refers to who decides what is in a platform's ecosystem. Said more generally, governance is a framework for how we choose to coexist. Checking for naming inconsistencies and implementation detail, uh, that's one thing. I'm challenging you to get to a higher level. And that's to be a conscientious creator of organizational arrangements. Changing the way we communicate is a precursor and then changing the organizations is the ultimate goal. That's the true power of API governance. There's a number of books, as I mentioned. Uh, there's a fair amount of excellent research being done in the space right now about organizations and what an effective organization looks like. There's also a fair amount of things on change. Many of them are related to individuals, but the ones that I've listed here can also equally apply to organizations. My name is Matthew Reimbold. Again, I hope you're safe. I hope you're healthy. And I hope to talk with you again soon. Awesome. Thank you, Matthew. Really appreciate that. Um, uh, reminders of the audience, if there's any questions, um, submit them there on the, the, the chat window and we'll take them. I know that Bill for sure would like to know where you got your overalls from. He's, he's definitely jealous.
Uh, my overalls, that was a question I was not prepared to answer. Um, so this is uh, Texas Canvas Wares. And yes, this is my workspace. I do stuff with my hands as well as with my mind all day. So if nothing else, it's a glorified pocket protector. I, I love it. I was just going to say that. It's a uh, convenient place to keep things because even as you were talking, I was like, I should write that down. Like, There's no pen <laughs> anywhere in my vicinity right now. I don't know where I took it. Um, awesome. Well, uh, I'm sure uh, Matthew would uh, love to continue the conversation on Twitter or somewhere else, so please reach out to him. Um, Eric is keen to get started, so um, we're going to transition over to him any second now. Um, just a reminder for everybody, we're in the API governance track, and we're going to continue this conversation um, for the next three sessions. Thank you again, Matthew. It was a real pleasure.